Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daegan Huang, uh, chairing the today talk uh, for uh, Dr. Sky Jisai. He usually uh, chair this section, but he uh, cannot make the, this talk today. So uh, happy Valentine's Day, and it's really cold. Yeah, so today, I uh, really thank you uh, for coming to uh, IBEST uh, Visiting Natural Series. So we have today uh, Dr. Rezai. So Dr. Rezai is uh, associate associate professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, Rasong uh, School of Engineering at Uni uh, York University. And then he's a researcher in the field of the microfluidics and the laboratory. So he was an ANSOC visiting fellow at the Public Health Agents of Canada in Gulf and Ontario for a year before uh, starting his academic career at York, York, York University in 2013. Uh, currently, he is the director of the Advanced Center for Microfluidic Technology and Engineering. He also serves as a founding graduate program director of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at York University. And he is also the Latin editor of Can Canadian Society for uh, Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Uh, Rezai's research focuses on the interactions between biological uh, species uh, space, uh, specimens and uh, fluid in a micro environment. And he has been recognized by multiple awards and in the conditions such as 2000, 2019 Ontario Early Research Award and cover article in a soft matter in 2018 and interview with the Nevada Chief Journalist as an emerging investigator in 2017. Please welcome to Dr. Uh, Reza. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for uh, the kind introduction and uh, hello to everyone who attended uh, in the front, on the back, uh, on an on a, uh, important day, February 14th. So happy Valentine's Day to, to everyone. Um, I, I'm sure everybody is looking forward to finishing this talk and go to the loved ones at the end. Uh, so I'm sure everybody is going to have some fun tonight. Uh, but before that, we'll do some so the presentation on microfluidic uh, technologies for, for zebrafish studies. Um, as I said, or as the chair mentioned, I'm coming from York University. I started a couple of years ago over there, 2013, um, as, uh, as an assistant professor. And uh, we've been developing uh, Lausanne School of Engineering. Uh, I, I joined Lausanne as the, as the third uh, faculty member in the Department of Mechanical engineering and uh, since there uh, we have expanded quite a bit uh, so I thought maybe I provide everyone with a little bit of background before going to the to the content of the talk uh, and uh, quickly do this and go forward so um, York University actually had um, uh, a faculty of science and engineering uh, only two small programs electrical engineering and uh, computer science and earth and space science and engineering uh, departments were there uh, from 2001, uh, but mainly in 2012, the idea of, you know, uh, developing all of these other engineering uh, departments started at Lausanne. And since then, you know, civil engineering, mechanical engineering have, uh, have come forward. Uh, computer science, electrical engineering has expanded uh, quite a bit as well. So we started, uh, as I said, like I came at, uh, in 2013, we started in 2014 with, uh, with two, three people. Uh, at the moment, we are at uh, 20 faculty members. And the idea is to grow to 23 faculty members at steady state. Um, we do offer an undergraduate program in mechanical engineering, uh, intake of around 100 students a year, 110 students. And the program at the moment is around 350 undergraduates. Um, and we started our graduate program officially from uh, 2015. We did have, uh, you know, have student uh, from 2013, but officially mechanical engineering started in 2015, and since then we've grown from, uh, you know, two students to over 65 students at the moment. And uh, I think the steady state number of graduate students in the program would be close to 100 students or so in the next couple of years. Uh, we offer a Master of Applied, Applied Science, we offer a PhD degree, and we offer a direct PhD degree. Uh, at, at mechanical, all in, in, in mechanical engineering disciplines. Um, these are um, a number of research laboratories in mechanical. Um, as you see, you don't see a lot of, uh, you know, conventional mechanical engineering, like metal forming and, uh, and, and heat transfer, uh, for example, laboratories. We do try to hire 
uh, people with uh, a little bit uh, sort of uh, research programs in areas, uh, advanced mechanical engineering areas, interdisciplinary areas. Uh, my lab does microfluidics, but we do have, uh, you know, labs in the stem cell area, uh, biomedical optics, and a number of labs in uh, energy, and I think material would be the focus of the, uh, of the department as we have grown uh, to this number of professors. Um, that was just a short uh, intro about Lausanne, and uh, just to let people know that we, we are there and we're expanding and, uh, you know, hopefully we're looking very much forward to, to establishing collaboration and partnership with other universities uh, like Ryerson, uh, with hospitals like St. Michael's and, uh, you know, all of these good institutions around NGTA. Um, my lab is Advanced Center for Microfluidics Technology and Engineering. Um, our focus is obviously in microfluidic area. And in that uh, particular area, we look at materials. So we look at developing, you know, composite uh, materials and composite polymers with uh, different electrical uh, properties or thermal properties. And this is to develop sensing uh, sort of mechanisms and, uh, and uh, actuation mechanisms within microfluidic devices. Uh, we also look at uh, developing, uh, you know, advanced microfabrication uh, techniques, uh, a little bit of, you know, printing and injection molding uh, research that goes on. And we also do a lot of characterization of these, uh, obviously, microfluidic devices uh, with an application mostly in health and, health and safety. Um, my work uh, during my PhD started with uh, a focus on C. elegans, uh, as a model organism in uh, microfluidic devices. So we, we were interested to look at the motion of C. elegans uh, within microfluidic devices, and particularly in response to electrical signal. And I will talk about why electrical signal in a, in a bit. But you know, after starting at uh, sort of York, uh, I've moved on to test this uh, behavior of organisms uh, such as Drosophila and zebrafish. Uh, to other stimulus, mostly again, electrical and chemical is the focus of our work, but you know, out of interest of uh, collaborators, we have been uh, working and we've been fortunate to work with people who are you know, doing optical research or uh, you know, effect of uh, magnetic and thermal uh, stimuli as well. Um, but our expertise stays within the area of developing these microfluidic devices to control stimulus and to quantify uh, outcomes, behaviors of, of uh, organisms. We also look at smaller uh, sort of components, uh, such as droplets, uh, bacteria, uh, or particles uh, within microfluidic devices. And uh, you know, all the story comes up uh, or comes together from the perspective that uh, these uh, uh, stimulus over there are obviously environmental cues that all of these organisms are, and us humans are, are exposed to. And obviously that leads to outcomes like uh, behaviors and uh, neuronal and muscular responses that needs to be characterized with uh, applications in human disease studies and drug screening. So that's really the focus area with the organisms. When you look at the microorganisms, um, our focus is to uh, develop point of care diagnostic devices for, for sorting, separation, basically sample preparation to facilitate detection of all of these uh, say pathogens in water and with food in, 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 in beverages and so on. So that mostly to be able to do that at the site of sample acquisition is the focus of our uh, work. But you know, when you look at it, you, you, you have uh, sort of organisms in the uh, size and scale of micrometers uh, from one, one or a few micrometer all the way to a couple of millimeters. Uh, and they're interacting with fluids. So that's basically the multi-phase fluid uh, interest that we have in our, uh, in our lab. Um, today, I'm not gonna talk about uh, sort of everything, obviously, we, we wanna focus on zebrafish and the microfluidic zebrafish studies that we've been doing. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of slides on, on the research motivation, uh, focusing mostly on drug screening and uh, model organisms, in particular zebrafish. I'm sure everybody is well familiar with that, so I'll try to go uh, through that quickly. But the uh, point is to establish that there is need for uh, not only cellular studies, but also behavioral studies. And that's really the focus that we are taking to look at the behavior of these organisms. And for that, I present to you uh, three microfluidic devices that my students have been uh, sort of working on over the past uh, five years, uh, looking at the motion 
uh, mostly of uh, free to move animals and also semi mobile animals, uh, zebrafish, uh, in response to different uh, stimulus, like electrical and mostly chemical. And uh, how to quantify these responses and how to extract uh, or maximize extraction of information from all of these assets. Um, the, the, the applications that I'm going to show, chemical and gene application studies that we have, uh, we have done is obviously proof of concept applications to show that our devices can be applied uh, for, for biological uh, assays. And uh, we're really, really looking forward to taking these devices to the next step to do some uh, innovative science with them as well, uh, hopefully through partnership and collaboration with people over here. Uh, so I hope uh, today's talk is going to end up uh, in some good partnerships in the future. Not sure why that is happening there, but uh, there we go. All right, so um, very quickly, we all know that the uh, process of uh, sort of drug screening starts from having uh, hundreds of thousands of chemicals that have to be tested against uh, different models, starting with you know, uh, cell culture models, uh, conventional cells on, on petri dishes. And I think there's a lot of discussion already in place that these are not really uh, presenting the uh, complicated biological environment within the human body. And there's a lot of move over there to, move, uh, to develop uh, sort of tissues and organs that are better representatives of, of the human body. And uh, to be able to do drug screening in vitro in a better way. Um, right after that, you know, a certain number of these drugs are uh, forwarded into the in vivo studies, which again, a lot of people do focus on, uh, you know, mammalian models and, and uh, all of these vertebrate models, which are very, uh, uh, sort of restricted in terms of ethics, and they're very complex uh, organisms in order to develop them and also uh, to test them, especially when it comes to testing them at very high throughput. Uh, and of course, then you come to, to the clinical assays with a couple of these drugs, and a lot of these processes lead to failure of the drug because of, uh, you know, toxicity issues or other issues that happen through the process. So there are a couple of papers, and I think everybody agrees that you know, uh, there's, there's huge gap in the process of, of uh, choosing models for drug screening, uh, starting from the 2D cell cultures, which are really experimentally accessible all the way to human beings, which are really biologically you, relevant. Um, so there's a huge gap in this area uh, that needs to be addressed. And people have done or have focused on uh, 3D cell cultures or organoids um, and organs on a chip. Uh, so basically, they develop these 3D cell cultures and organoids and put them on microfluidic devices uh, to, to test them. But again, there's a huge uh, gap in between models in here. And uh, there are papers out there claiming, and I agree, that you know, all, all, this gap can also be filled with model organisms, simpler model or, or organisms like sea elegans, like uh, zebrafish that we're going to talk to today, and like uh, fruit fly. So we do work on developing microfluidic devices uh, for, for these organisms. Why, I think everybody knows here, they're uh, sort of genetically uh, similar to, to human. Uh, some of these organisms are fully, you know, sequenced in terms of their genome, uh, you know, the connectivity or the cellular system and the network of neurons are, are quite well understood in, uh, in some of them. Uh, they have a very small size. Uh, it can be looked at from a disadvantage point of view, but it can also be advantages in terms of how many you can put under microscope, for example, and study, so you can really move towards high throughput studies using whole organisms. Um, relatively easy to grow compared to, to rodents, uh, and, and cost, which is low. Uh, a huge advantage, which is the transparent body of, of you know, C. elegans, uh, Drosophila, and, and zebrafish, uh, up to a certain point, and uh, you know, the uh, use of, of genetic tools to tag specific cells uh, with all of these, you know, exciting uh, GFP and GCAM molecules to look at activities of neurons and, and, and brain and, and, and all that. So that's a huge advantage in the area. Um, they have a short life cycle. Within a couple of days, you can actually have, or a couple of weeks, you can, you can develop them. And again, this is something that leads to uh, sort of uh, ability to develop high throughput uh, and, and rapid screening uh, technologies, which are quite needed in, in drug screening process, especially at the beginning when you want to screen a huge number of drugs. 
Um, and obviously they've been, you know, uh, modeled for different kind of human diseases, for genetic studies, for behavioral studies, for uh, drug screening, toxicology, and so on. Uh, but the, the problem is the need for, for developing technologies to look at these uh, biological processes from cellular to all the way to behavior uh, quantitatively. And uh, we know that there are technologies out there that can do, uh, do these uh, automatically, but there's a lot of challenges with these uh, technologies in terms of them failing or not operating in, in, uh, in ideal conditions or them being very expensive and not accessible to all the researchers in the area. So the idea is to come up with better solutions with uh, low cost solutions and enable scientists and biologists to be able to do all of these behavioral assays um, uh, using low cost technologies. Uh, when you look at the process of you know, response, obviously we know that you know, uh, it is stimulated uh, by, by a, a, a particular uh, sort of factor. And then there's the sensory system, there's the command center, as, uh, the brain and the, the central nervous system. Uh, involved and obviously the motor system which is involved to generate the response. So when you look at the two ends of spectrum in terms of stimulus and, and also the response when it comes to zebrafish studies, uh, it becomes quite challenging. Uh, main reason is the zebrafish, especially at the larval stages, uh, is very small in the, in, the, in the scale of a couple of millimeters. And uh, we need to be able to, first of all, control the, the stimulus that we are going to apply to the, to the animal. And we need to be able to quantify the, the response. And we have to do this quantification on, on different levels. Um, when you look at the stimulus itself, we were looking for um, sort of a factor that is uh, very easy to control in terms of magnitude, first of all. So we can uh, control the, uh, the size of the stimulus or the amount of stimulus that we deliver uh, to the zebrafish. Uh, we wanted to be able to control the direction of it quite easily and quite rapidly. That's a, time is a big factor as well. Um, again, organism being very small, it would be a challenge to expose it to a specific stimulus. So that was another factor space that we need to uh, take into consideration. Um, and rapidity is another thing. So we wanted to be able to, to turn this signal on and off very fast. And we wanted to be able to pattern this response, right? So. Or, or the stimulus itself. Um, so when you look at different stimuli, uh, such as chemicals, uh, such as uh, the, the, the thermal uh, uh, stimulus, uh, they would uh, suffer from some of the disadvantages such as time dependency, concentration, which is very hard to, hard to control with, with respect to time and space, and, and so on and so forth. So out of this you know, preliminary uh, sort of assessment came out electricity. So electricity we can easily apply, we can uh, control the magnitude of it, we can have DC, we can have AC, we can have different uh, uh, sort of uh, duty cycles, uh, and we can play very easily with it uh, within a microfluidic device. And obviously when it comes to the response quantification, you're not, you want to be able to look at neurons, uh, you want to be able to look at muscles and activity of the muscles, want to go down to organ level, maybe look at the heartbeat uh, activities. Uh, and obviously in zebrafish case, you want to look at the behavior. You want to look at the mouth motion, the, the eyes motion, the fins, the tail frequency, and, and all that. And uh, our lab thinks that we can do that with microfluidics. So if you integrate microfluidic devices and, and electrical signal together, uh, we thought that we can generate uh, rapid behavioral screening devices. So uh, here's a picture of the setup that we uh, sort of work with in our lab. Uh, and I'm going to present multiple chips, maybe three microfluidic chips, but they're all basically using the same setup. Uh, so in this setup, you have the uh, a regular microscope. Uh, you know, in this case, uh, you have your microfluidic setup, which is uh, fully isolated in terms of, uh, you know, the liquid that comes into it and gets out of it. So nothing is going to leak on the microscope or anything. Everything is contained within all of these tubes and channels. Um, you have uh, pumps, obviously, to, to put your samples inside, um, including fish and the chemicals that you want to expose your fish to. And then we do have this uh, sort of a power supply or a source meter where we can apply a highly controlled uh, voltage and current uh, sort of uh, signals 
uh, down to let's say current of uh, say pico amps and, and uh, we can uh, measure the resistance of the circuit, we can measure the voltage output of the system and so on. So um, this is the full system. We apply electrical signal through this across the microfluidic device. We uh, bring fish inside in, uh, in microfluidic uh, channels and we look at the response of this fish to, to electric signal. Um, the first chip that we developed, uh, it's called the Freely Moving Zebrafish Electrical Assay. Um, so what you're looking at is a loading uh, tube which has an angle in order not to affect the zebrafish when it comes into the device because it, had, it, it has to rotate by, or it has to turn by 90 degrees and that would be sort of uh, having a, a negative impact on, on the fish. So we had to work on the angle of loading. Uh, so this one has a 45 degrees angle which perfectly uh, loads the zebrafish inside this channel. Uh, just due to uh, space restriction, we do have this U-shaped channel and we bring the fish all the way to this environment over, over there. Uh, you stop the flow so nothing is moving in terms of the, the fluid inside the channels. And then we have these two um, uh, reservoirs over here where we put our electrodes inside and we apply electric field or electric current uh, in the scale of uh, three to around 30 microamps. And we look at the behavior of the fish um, as it's exposed to, uh, to electrical signal. So this video I'm going to show, uh, initially the fish is sort of facing the left hand side. And uh, what we do is we position the cathode uh, in the front and anode at the back. And we have done the reverse order as well. And what we see here uh, is that as soon as you apply the electricity, uh, these fish have a tendency to turn and move towards the positive electrode, which is the anode electrode. So once again, it's off, and then as soon as you turn off, they rotate and start moving around. Obviously, the quality of the video has been reduced for you to be able to see it, but if you record this video, then you can look at different phenomena, different phenotypes using uh, uh, image analysis and video analysis. So for that, we look at uh, the, the ratio of electrotaxis response, and initially we, we called it electrotaxis, but over time, I think we're changing this terminology to electric response at the moment because we're not sure 100% that it is, it is uh, electrotaxis. So if you look at the ratio of the fish that respond when you don't apply any electric field, then obviously that uh, magnitude or the value is very low. And then as soon as you expose them to three microamp, you see that around 80% of them would actually respond uh, to the electric field. And you uh, sort of increase the amount of current to 15 microamp, that value goes higher to 100% uh, of the fish respond. Um, when they're responding and when they're, when they're moving around, if you measure their speed, uh, then we are reporting sort of their electrotaxis speed over there, which is on the order of 90 millimeters per second at, uh, at three microamp uh, current value. And then uh, going all the way to 15 microamp, we do see that there's this significant drop in the, in the velocity. And when you look at the videos, you actually see that there's a little bit of uh, paralysis basically or uh, electrocution going on when you increase obviously your, your uh, electrical current. So you do want to stay at the mild level uh, not to affect the behavior of these fish uh, significantly. Um, so an important question when you look at the papers that are on a general locomotion of, of the fish, uh, we saw that at night time the, the general locomotion of the fish actually uh, reduces, so they move less basically. And uh, the question that was asked by uh, one of my students was whether that happens to the electric response as well. Uh, so he does that uh, test at daytime and he uh, sees, you know, uh, this huge uh, response of 80 plus percent of the fish to, to electrical signal. And when you do that at nighttime, there's this again uh, significant drop in the response when you apply three microns. Um, again, by looking into the literature, we found that, uh, that the dopaminergic activities of the fish apparently during the nighttime diminishes a bit and uh, sort of in terms of activity, again, general locomotion uh, goes down. And uh, what we did is exposure of this fish to um, uh, a dopamine agonist, uh, apomorphin, at uh, three different concentrations. And you do see that at around 0.2 uh, micromolar at nighttime, you can actually uh, increase the electric response quite significantly. Um, and then by increasing the concentration of apomorphine, we do see a decrease again. Um, 
this is a question that is not known to us. We're looking into it, but we don't know why this happens. But again, on general locomotion side, what people have shown is an increase of the uh, locomotion, a drop, and then an increase again. So again, a dose-dependent activity uh, that uh, we do see on electric response as well. But in terms of increase in uh, sort of electric response, we sort of concluded that the dopaminergic uh, system of, of the zebrafish might be involved in uh, sort of uh, this electrical response of the fish. Um, so moving one step further, uh, we sort of exposed this fish to uh, selective uh, agonist, uh, SKF, which is uh, sort of uh, affecting the D1 receptors, and uh, uh, queen pyrrole, which is affecting the D2-like uh, receptors. And as you see again at nighttime, uh, by uh, sort of uh, using SKF, there's not much variation in electrical response, but then as soon as you do a D, uh, D2-like uh, receptor uh, exposure, then you would see an increase in the, in the electric response. So again, it seems like the D2-like receptors are more involved in sensing this electrical signal and producing a response. Again, something that needs to be investigated further um, in the future, but uh, the point that we're establishing over here that, first of all, electrical response, on-demand response is sort of a useful uh, tool that is uh, relatively working similar to general locomotion. And then there's obviously involvement of, of different kind of dopaminergic system receptors in, in this particular uh, sort of behavior. Um, so that's when you look at the general locomotion, the, the movement of a fish when it's free to move. Um, then uh, in the future, what we, have, we are aiming for at the moment is the ability to uh, sort of immobilize the fish uh, on particular regions, mainly the brain, to be ordered to image the brain in the future while being able to at the same time do uh, behavioral studies. So this is the fish that was developed uh, by, by another two students, uh, the, the chip, that basically has a chamber and then it has a loading channel over here that you see on this image. It's a multi-layer uh, microfluidic device. Basically the, the main channels are on the top layer there's a, there's a membrane in between the, two, the, the top layer and the bottom layer. And on the bottom layer, you just have uh, a valving channel. Um, and this is the assembly that you see. So this uh, channel over here is actually the, the valving channel. Uh, there's a membrane in between that you don't see, of course. And there's the top channel, which has all of these chambers and loading channels and all. Um, the reason that we use membrane is uh, to position the fish inside this trap and then activate the membrane to prevent it from escaping the, uh, the trap. Uh, the, the tail of the larva is actually free to move inside this chamber, so we can actually look at the, uh, the tail motions. So this video on the left-hand side is uh, showing the process of loading. So this is uh, putting the fish inside uh, and activating the, the, the valve in the front to immobilize the fish. And um, of course, the fish is not exposed to any stimulus at the moment, so uh, the movement is, is minimal. As I said, we haven't done any uh, fluorescent imaging yet on the brain side, uh, so we don't know how it, it is going to look like, but it seems like we do have opportunities over here to partner and to collaborate uh, to be able to do that. After loading the fish and then uh, immobilizing it and waiting for a set time for it to get used to the environment, then you can expose it to any stimulus. Um, I think over here we're doing uh, exposure to l arginine and it has been shown that l arginine actually affects the uh, activity, again, the general uh, locomotion of the fish. And as soon as you bring l arginine inside, you do see that activity of the fish uh, happening in the pool. And uh, if you look at the, the brain side, um, in order, like in terms of motion, there's not much motion over, uh, happening over here. So we're really optimistic that we are going to be able to do some fluorescent imaging in this area, uh, which is again, hopefully going to happen uh, in the future. Uh, just some data, so we're looking at the tail beat frequency of, of the fish as soon as you expose it to, uh, to L-arginine. And uh, we're changing the concentration of this chemical at the bottom, orders of magnitude from 10 to the power of minus 12 to micro and then to milli uh, uh, molars. And then uh, this assay is being done in a microfluidic device that I just showed. And in parallel, it is being done inside a droplet 
where the fish is actually free to move and it's outside a microfluidic device. And in terms of trend, you would see that they're uh, sort of looking exactly the same, increase at 10 to the power of minus nine, a significant difference uh, before that, that is also happening in the droplet and, and so on. And we do see a little bit more sort of active uh, behavior of the zebrafish within the microfluidic device compared uh, to a droplet, uh, especially when you look at lower concentrations. Um, an interesting phenomenon that we're seeing is, you know, on, on concentrations before, uh, you know, micromolar, uh, under micromolar, we're mostly seeing a J-turn behavior of the, of the fish within the pool. And then as soon as you go into millimolar of exposure, this type of behavior changes to, to C patterns. Uh, so we're, we're sort of excited about being able to identify different kind of motor patterns in, in zebrafish larvae in the future. Uh, using a software that we are developing and collaborating with people in machine learning and, and artificial intelligence who can really take these videos and identify uh, patterns for us and, and teach the machine and improve the assessment process as we go forward. Um, so that's a semi-mobile fish where you can look at basically the brain uh, from the top and you can actually look at the, the tail motion to sort of do a little bit of behavioral assay. Uh, looking at the literature, we do see that a lot of people are interested to look at the heart activities, uh, 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 the, the, the mouth activities, and uh, for that, there's a need for imaging the fish from the side. Uh, either imaging the fish from the side or you have to rotate the fish to the, to the side to be able to see it under microscope. Um, so far in the, in the literature, what we looked at is, you know, different microfluidic devices that has been developed either for positioning the larva upright or to turn the larvae uh, to the side to be able to look at uh, the behavior to the side. Uh, I don't think anybody has shown uh, the multi-directional imaging yet. So for that purpose, um, my students, uh, Arzu, who is over here, and uh, Ellen, uh, they implemented basically an optical prism inside the device. So with use of this optical prism, uh, what you can do is you can actually look from the top to be able to see the brain from the top and the tail activities, but you can also focus on this prism area and look at the side image to look at the mouth activities and heart activities. So here's a video that is taken through the prism. And if you pay attention over here, I think you do see the activities of the heart. Uh, and then we can also see uh, some, some mouth activities, uh, not in this video, but on, uh, on other uh, videos, maybe uh, a bit more uh, sort of distinct. Uh, we just look at the number of uh, beats per minute to come up with the heart rate of the, of the zebrafish larvae. And at the same time, we can actually have this top view uh, of the fish. Uh, to look at the, uh, the behavior. So in here, we're exposing the fish to, to electricity. And uh, we look at the uh, tail motion, of course. Uh, the software that we have actually takes a point at the tail and then starts tracking that point across and gives us an XY position. And out of that, we can assess uh, you know, the velocity, the frequency, and, uh, and other parameters. Um, particularly over here, we look at the response duration. So how, how long does the fish respond when you expose it for 30 seconds to, to electrical signal? And we also look at the tail beat frequency uh, of this motion as well. So uh, just the effect of uh, electric field, uh, first of all, or the direction of the electric field on uh, semi-mobile zebrafish larvae was first studied. Uh, you're looking at the x-axis over here. Uh, it says anode position at head and anode position at tail. So this is the anode position at head. So basically putting the positive electrode in the, in the front of the larvae versus the uh, positive electrode at the back of the larvae. And if you remember from the free to move uh, zebrafish uh, assay, uh, we showed that they want to move towards the, uh, towards the cathode. So basically over here, they're sort of in, uh, stimulated to rotate and go towards the, uh, to, towards the anode. But obviously, because they're immobilized and they're prevented from going out from the, uh, from the, from the trap, they're not going to be able to do that. Um, looking at the, uh, at the data, uh, in terms of response duration, if you put the anode at the head, obviously the response duration is going to be extremely short, but with high frequency. So it looks like a shock. As soon as you put, uh, turn on the electricity, there's a high frequency for a short period of time and it sort of stops. 
And if you put the anode at the tail over here in this picture, then the response duration is a bit longer for, for this group of larvae. And they tend to do a more smooth motion. So the frequency is reducing and they're basically doing it for a longer time. And we sort of took this approach over here, the anode at the tail, to move forward um, with the rest of the assay. Um, so we could do two things. We could do the tail imaging, but we could also do the uh, heart activity. And for that, we're just showing a proof of concept assay with, uh, with uh, ethanol here. So if you expose the fish to ethanol uh, off the chip, this is the heart rate that you get. If you do that on the chip with no exposure, sorry, this is no exposure to ethanol. This is also no exposure to ethanol. So on chip and off chip activities of the heart rate are basically uh, statistically similar. And as soon as you expose them to around uh, 3% of ethanol, you would see this a statistical drop or the significant drop of the heart activity, showing that with our microfluidic device, we can actually uh, detect, we can expose, we can detect, and we can quantify uh, heart rate activities. And this actually matches with the off-chip ethanol assays that other papers have done in the past. But we sort of, because we can do now electricity and motion, we, we asked this question whether the electricity actually affects the heart rate of the fish, now that we can see it from the side. And the answer is during the application of electric field, uh, yes. So as soon as you apply the electric field, um, over here, three microamp uh, current again, you do see this uh, significant increase in the heart rate. Maybe it is because of stress or other factors. We're not sure yet. This is uh, sort of a very uh, recent uh, set of data. Uh, but as soon as you turn off the electric signal, uh, come you know, 30 seconds after or 60 seconds after or 90 seconds after, uh, the, the heart rate actually goes back to a normal position, which is not different from the uh, pre-exposure set. Um, we have looked at the effect of electric current magnitude. So in the picture, again, from left-hand side to right-hand side, you see increase of uh, the uh, current from one microamp to three to six to nine. And we do see that at uh, around three microamp, uh, the response duration is quite longer than the rest of the uh, current, and the frequency goes down. So again, that slow motion or smooth motion for longer period of time is happening at three microamp while at higher microamps or higher electrical currents, we do see this paralysis happening and sort of difficulty in motion uh, for, for the fish. So three, again, seems to be a current value that is uh, optimal to be taken for the rest of the experiments that we wanted to do. Now, recently we have attempted to show the application of this electrical stimulation and behavioral studies uh, in uh, sort of looking at the effect of 6-OHDA. Again, this is a very common chemical that has been studied on, on zebrafish, and we're doing a proof of concept over here. Um, so we increase the concentration of 6-OHDA, and you see around you know, 250 uh, micromolar of, of uh, 6-OHDA uh, exposure. I think for around uh, 32 hours uh, results in this drop of uh, response duration and also the drop of tail bit frequency of the larvae uh, under exposure to electrical field. Um, so this is just to show that our, our stimulation technique and our microfluidic technique can actually be used to look at the effect of uh, chemicals. This particular chemical is targeting you know, dopaminergic neurons, so we're not sure whether this is a suitable assay for neuron studies, but you know, this is the first step for us to, to get into the uh, business of you know, chemical screening. And uh, that shows that there's actually an effect that can be detected. Um, it gets a little bit more exciting when we actually expose the fish to 6-OHDA at 250 uh, micromolar for, for 32 hours. We saw that electrical response reduction in terms of tail bit frequency and response duration. And if you treat these uh, larvae with levodopa, which is the chemical or the drug that is used against uh, uh, or for, for, uh, for Parkinson. Uh, if you expose them after exposure to 6-OHDA, we do see that you know, the response, the electrical response returns back to a normal condition uh, for both conditions, again, under exposure to electrical signal. And uh, we did also see some drop in terms of heart rate activity when you expose the fish to 6-OHDA and return of that to normal level uh, upon uh, sort of exposure or treating it with uh, levodopa. Um, one uh, sort of our last, I think, um, 
study that we have done very recently, and this is in collaboration with Dr. Zoido back in uh, York University. He actually works on this uh, gene, uh, panx one a and uh, he came out uh, to us with a question of, uh, you know, we want to see whether there's a behavioral effect uh, knocking down this or knocking out this particular gene. And we did, again, the electrical assay for him. Uh, and you're looking at the data over here, again, uh, comparison, these pairs of comparison of wild type uh, and, uh, and the knockout fish uh, at one microamp, at three microamp, at six, and at nine microamp electrical uh, current. And more on the lower side at the one and three where the fish is not really paralyzed or not under the effect of uh, electricity, we do see that there's uh, quite a bit of variation or statistically significant at least uh, variation in terms of response duration and uh, the tail beat frequency. Uh, basically the knockout fish turns uh, out to be uh, sort of responding for a shorter period of time, but they're a bit more active. Uh, their frequency is going up and uh, they're sort of doing this for a shorter period of time with a higher frequency. Um, so again, uh, a hypothesis here that maybe this panx one a uh, so the gene might be involved in uh, sensing or uh, this whole process of electrical response, which needs to be, of course, uh, studied in the future, uh, just the application of the device in, in gene screening and the fact that we can actually use this electrical technique to, to look at the effect of genes on, on behavior. So I think in summary, um, what I want to mention is, you know, zebrafish does respond to electrical signal. We don't understand yet why. We don't know whether it has a genetic, a genetic uh, background or has uh, neurons involved, what muscles are involved in this process. And this needs to be investigated further in collaboration with scientists, of course. Um, but uh, we do know that it sort of induces a behavior. It induces a behavior and exposure of the fish to chemicals and knocking out of the, of the fish in terms of the genes would affect that behavior. So maybe it can be a tool to do uh, behavioral screening uh, using zebrafish as a model. And we do have the expertise to collaborate with people to develop such devices that uses not only electricity, but perhaps other stimuli as well, such as optical, such as thermal, chemical, and other stimuli to uh, study the behavior of the fish. One major sort of step that we're taking right now and we are trying hard to resolve the issues uh, with it is increasing the throughput of this microfluidic device as the video that you see on the, on the right hand side. Um, just because of the field of view that we currently have, uh, we have gone from one fish into four fish. But today in the lab, I saw that you know, we can screen or we can look at an area which is a couple of centimeters by a couple of centimeters uh, big. So using uh, sort of this technology or using this patterning technology into uh, using microfluidic microfabrication, we can actually increase the throughput of these assays, uh, hopefully significantly in the future, uh, to make it more suitable, uh, not for high throughput assays yet. Uh, we understand that there's a, there's a long way to go, but just to increase the throughput and do all of these chemical assays a bit much, uh, a bit uh, faster. Um, we're also trying to uh, basically record more behaviors. So we did start with motion of the tail. Uh, we added the prism to look at the heart. Uh, we do want to get the mouth motion through the side image. And then the, the, mo the move is basically to go towards uh, sort of the device that doesn't restrict the, uh, the eyes and the fins of the fish. So we basically grab to the mid body of the fish and we let the head and the tail to be free to move in order to be able to do uh, you know, other phenotypes at the same time. Um, fluorescent imaging is, is another activity that we need to do in the future. The reason we haven't done that yet, although the, fit, the, the chip is ready to go, is we, we don't have access to the strains that express GFP or GCAM. So we are interested to test our sort of electrical stimulation and see what happens in terms of brain activity. So that's one area that we are quite interested in. Um, most of these data that you saw have been developed using or have been assessed using a software, uh, open access software that we've been using, but recently we have developed this software that actually analyzes the video and gives you the tail beat frequency and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the heart rate and the mouth motion and hopefully the fins uh, frequency in the future as well. So that's one area that you're focusing on. Um, 
as I said, uh, you know, a couple of minutes ago, we're interested in integrating other uh, stimulus. Optical, chemical exposure can be uh, sort of pursued in the, uh, in the future using fibers and using channels to, to deliver precisely chemicals from known concentrations to these environments within the microfluidic device. I know that is particularly of interest in, you know, for people who are doing chemical screening. And we would be sort of able to collaborate with, uh, with you uh, if you're interested in using these uh, technologies. Um, yeah, that's my last slide. So thank you very much for, for the attention. I do have to thank my, my students. Uh, the work that I just presented are coming mostly from uh, you know, the thesis or the, the research that Ali Reza uh, or Zuhu is here, Ellen and Asal has done on zebrafish microfluidic in my lab, but also you know, other people have contributed and I'm missing their names over there. Uh, the funding agencies and uh, all the collaborators and uh, industrial and academic collaborators. And thank you for coming today and listening to me. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, if, if any, in this regard. Thank you. We have a couple of questions. The first one has to do with the phenomenon of the practice or 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 the practice there is a hypothesis that maybe by applying this electricity, there, there's, there's some sort of you know, muscular contraction that is helping to orient the larvae and the larvae is just moving uh, after that. We need to investigate that. Another thing is we need to provide more space to see if, uh, because now you have one degree of freedom motion towards the anode. If you, if you provide two degrees of freedom, uh, do they actually prefer to you know, escape from the electric field intensity, they want to go out of it, or they actually want to go towards it. So these, these are all questions that we, at the moment, don't know. Um, when you compare this behavior with C. elegans, it becomes a bit more complicated because C. elegans actually has the tendency to go towards the cathode. So it goes towards the negative pole, and these fish will go towards the, the, the positive pole. And that, that even makes it more complicated, basically, to answer. And my second question is, these are the biggest a zebra fish is is basically the the biggest that we can actually put in um, a device that we can sort of call microfluidics uh, we have gone all the way to seven days post uh, fertilization for zebra fish larvae uh, which is probably a couple of millimeters, three, four millimeters in terms of length and a millimeter thickness. Uh, and the features that you need within that device are micro features or less than a millimeter, which is the area of microfluidics. Uh, we can make devices which are bigger, uh, more suitable for, for larger larvae, but we just grow out of our area of microfluidics. And that's perfectly fine. We're, we're okay with developing those devices, but so far in trying to stay within the microfluidic domain. No, no problem. Uh -huh.
Exactly. Yeah, no, uh, definitely having uh, another direction of movement and uh, basically mutants uh, or, or somehow uh, using uh, chemicals uh, to sort of uh, put these, for example, gaps into silence and then test and see whether there's any variation in the behavior. Uh, we're quite interested in, in doing that now that we have seen, you know, the response of all of these white type animals. Uh, for sure, I agree with you 100%. We have a second talk right after, so we're going to have a last, uh, we're going to take a last uh, session. Okay, um, we are, uh, in terms of exposure, we're just following a protocol which was uh, sort of published. It is uh, sort of pre-exposure before the assay. So we have exposed them off the chip in uh, multi-well plates, and then we wash them, and we bring them uh, inside the microfluidic device without, uh, without the chemical and test them. Okay, so this is the first talk, and then uh, we're going to have a second talk. So please, uh, thank you again, and please uh, stay around. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zaid, a great uh, talk.